If you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 30 for a few moments. We've been on a journey the last month together. We've explored this topic of cultivating a desire for God. We've been mindful of the fact that sometimes as Christ followers, as disciples of Jesus, that our desire lags. And so we've explored the four R's, as it were. One would be recognize the current reality. Where, where does our desire lie now? Then to repent, and we talked about the flip side of repentance, is turning to Jesus that we might be able to turn from sin. That we, we, we request, we cry out to God to create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And then to rejoice, as we talked about the joy of the Lord and that He delights in us and He is for us. And this morning... I didn't think we were quite done, and so we have a two-for-one. We have a double-header this morning. Repeat and remember. And I'm going to tie remember in with the Lord's table this morning. And so our text is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'll read verse 1 to 10, and we'll just think about a couple of phrases in verse 1 and 2. But before we do that, Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing as we read and interact with his word as we do. O oh Lord, in your mercy and kindness, open your word to us and open us to your word. Deuteronomy 30, starting at verse 1, this is Moses preaching to the children of Israel. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind, remember, among all the nations where the Lord you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice, and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord God will gather you, and from there he will take you, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand and the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your cattle and in the, in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord again will take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the law that when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And then he adds, For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard from you, for you neither is it far off. It is within reach. Moses is preaching to the people of Israel as he is concluding his leadership of the nation and even as the people are on the threshold of the promised land. And he's urging them to call to mind, to remember all the blessings and curses that he has described as they remember who they are as people of God and what God has done for them. He urges them to return to the Lord your God when they go astray, when their love for God fades and they follow after foreign gods. And we can see this in the life of the nation of Israel in the years 
and centuries to follow. The cycle of continually having to repeat this and the repeated urging to remember what God has done and who they are. Repeat and remember. But it's not only for the nation of Israel, it is for us today. And even as we think through and remember the times in our own life, and maybe it's now for you, when your appetite or desire for God is dull, it's faded, we realize that our walk with God, our relationship with God is not static. It's dynamic. It is alive. Very much like our relationships with other people, perhaps with our spouse, with our close loved ones. These relationships don't remain the same. They're either growing in health or they're growing in unhealth, I guess if that's a word. It takes constant work and effort to keep a relationship healthy. When that work and effort ceases, the relationship doesn't stay healthy. When the effort and work ceases in a relationship, it progresses in unhealth, in disease, as it were. The thing that we would do well to remember as well is that the length of time we've been a Christian doesn't necessarily speak to our health, our vitality, or our fruitfulness as a Christian. Marriages can be much the same. Just because a couple has been married for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years doesn't mean their marriage is good. Doesn't mean it's healthy or full of vitality. Some, some, sometimes couples just stay married because they're too stubborn to get divorced. Sometimes we just stay married because they just settle, thinking that change is beyond them and this is the cards I've been dealt. Sometimes a couple has lost even a faintest glimmer of hope that things could change. And their marriage could be better, could be good, could, could even be great. Just a side note, word of hope and encouragement, if, if that seems to be the case for you to this day, the Lord delights in healing and restoring marriages as precious to Him. Because it's a picture of Him and his bride. And it's amazing what 20 minutes of broken, humble confession, repentance, and forgiveness can do in a relationship. There is hope. For this past month, one of the things we haven't really explored is why our desire for God sometimes is low. Why our appetite for him is sometimes dull. Why does our appetite for the one who loves us the most has blessings for us beyond our wildest imaginations? The one who knows us through and through and loves us anyway. Why does our desire to love him fade? Why do we have to repeat time after time, after time. I think there's many causes, many factors that draw us away from desiring God, from our first love. Many of those things are good. Good things. Food and drink, work, family, health. If we're not careful, these can become our gods, our idols. Perhaps we are distracted. Perhaps we have sin in our lives, known sin. And we don't want to deal with it. Maybe it is, as John writes in 1 John, maybe... It has to do with the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes and the pride of life. Money, sex, and power have drawn us away. 
maybe it's maybe it's laziness and and by that I mean laziness isn't doing nothing necessarily that's idleness <laughs> laziness is not doing what you're supposed to be doing it's been a revelation to me that sometimes I'm lazy which means I'm not doing what I should be doing I find something else to do that's funner maybe we just don't want to deal with the stuff we should deal with because it's going to take work so we do something that's easy quick maybe something that dulls our appetite is that we just have shallow roots of faith we haven't pushed the gospel deep into our lives as it were we talked a little bit about that in Sunday school there's other things that dull our appetite for God but one I want to talk about a little bit this morning for a few minutes it was brought to my attention several months ago in an article by Marshall Siegel he's a staff writer at desiringgod.org and he entitled his art article what dulls your appetite for God and he quotes John Piper in his book A Hunger for God as writing this the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison but apple pie it is not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven but endless nibbling at the table of the world it's not the x-rated video but the prime time dribble of triviality we drink in every night as I thought about that quote and the principles behind it I think it's spot on in many respects for many of us what dulls our appetite for God is not the the great attractiveness or seeming thrill of of the big sin but it's the endless nibbling at the table of the world that maybe we do without even thinking about C.S. Lewis painted the same picture in mere Christianity of the boy being satisfied with making mud pies in the slum because he couldn't imagine what is meant by a holiday at the sea and C.S. Lewis writes we are far too easily pleased we may understand this principle better by the familiar to some of us admonition don't ruin your supper usually a prize to teenage boys <laughs> don't ruin your supper supper is being prepared throughout the day the bread is baking desserts cooling on the counter the roast is in the oven vegetables are being cut and washed and prepared good food that will bring nourishment and strength for our bodies is being prepared with love and care and what happens throughout the day there's some bag of chips here handful of candies here can of pop just happened to be in the shop some popcorn at home hardware go to Princess Auto and lo and behold they got Hawkins cheesies like little bags so. and cost goes right across the parking lot I mean a buck and a half for a Polish I mean <laughs> come on it's three o'clock I'm starving by the time supper rolls around we just don't have an appetite I'm not hungry for the good stuff for the food that's going to nourish us and hold us until breakfast worthwhile food and junk food is just designed to make us want more of the same we know that right there's a science behind it fast food junk food it's designed to make us want more of that and it's a vicious cycle bringing more and more poor health and dysfunction but this is what often happens to our spiritual appetite we try to satisfy the appetites that we have for purpose and significance and love and be belonging with junk food 
to the point that we don't even desire what's good and healthy for us. We're so full of chips, we don't want vegetables and fruit and meat that will bring health and strength to us. We become accustomed to the taste of spiritual junk food that we can't handle the solid food of the gospel. We want quick fixes spiritually, don't we? But just take the sickness away. What? Yeah. Well, there's also the verse that is, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. We want five steps to a better whatever. Yeah. The gospel doesn't always work like that. We just want an app for it. <laughs> we want to learn patience. Surely there's an app to learn that. Surely there's an app to learn discipline. Surely there's an app to be kind. We want these quick fixes when we're really meant for deeper, richer, more satisfying things. We want to be entertained. More than that, we want to be amused. We don't want to think deeply through things. Why is it like this? Why am I experiencing this? What does it mean when? We don't want to sit and think deeply through these things we want a three minute theology and just tell me what to do I don't want to think right I don't want to think through that because it's hard just tell me what to do well the gospel doesn't work like that we need to tr retrain our appetites and it's a process and so we have to keep repeating these steps over and over and over again. And it's not because we have to learn the exact same lesson in exactly the same way. The gospel is bigger than that. But as Timothy Keller says, we want to push the gospel deep and deeper into our own lives until his light shines everywhere in every corner even the ones that we don't admit are there because there's things in our life that we don't talk about ever with anyone I was talking to my friend Murray the pastor in Three Hills and he says there's about 5 to 10% of our life that we don't talk about with anyone. Not even our spouse. All of us have a deep, dark corner that we just keep it that way because it seems to be easier. As we deal with those things and bring them out into the light and shine the light of the gospel on them. It helps develop our appetite because we find out how rich and how satisfying and how freeing it is to walk in the light. See, these principles that we learn, the principles are the same. Same as we teach the kids. Be kind, share, be respectful, same thing we learn again today right it's just in a different situation with different people we need to develop the appetite for the gospel to have those same principles pushed into every corner of our life I like the line in the song it says something about shame being gone Some of us have this cloud of shame that is following us around and we can't get free from it. In the gospel, 
as we push that into our lives, he takes our shame away and brings freedom. We, we never exhaust, we never get past the gospel. We just get farther into it, and it gets farther into us. And the farther in it goes, the bigger it gets. It's amazing. The Word of God is living and powerful. And it, the Word of God, He, changes us. A little bit at a time. It's called sanctification. And so we repeat. <laughs> oh God, I did this again. I'm sorry. I'm away from you. Please forgive me. Change my heart. So you can help me change my behavior. Thank you for being for me and not against me. Help me to walk in your joy. Again and again and again. There's no shame in that. But we might be discouraged thinking that all we're ever doing <laughs> is, is saying, sorry God, <laughs> blew it again. It's like, and we expect to hear, oh, a bad kid. For the love of Pete, he probably wouldn't say that, but what, what do you, he doesn't get exasperated with us. He doesn't get frustrated with us. He goes, my son, my daughter, come to me. Return to me. And I will forgive. Yes, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that great? But lest we be discouraged because we tend to forget and we have to repeat this, we remember. We talked in Sunday school about how Moses in Deuteronomy had challenged with his people and pleaded with them to remember who God is, what he'd done for them, who they are in his eyes. And they were given various feasts throughout the year to remind them of these things. And they were to take time, a lot of time, to rest and to celebrate God and his deliverances and his favor upon them. Moses again and again and again admonished the people, remember that you were, you were slaves. But now you're my people. I brought you out. I delivered you. I redeemed you. You're not slaves anymore. You're my people. You bear my name. This is who you are. But we're not Jewish. We're not Israelites. So what do we have? We don't keep the feasts. We don't go to Jerusalem three times a year for the feast. We As followers of Jesus, though, he's given us the ordinances, the sacraments, to remember and celebrate what he's done in our lives. He's given us baptism, and it's always a great day when we celebrate a baptism. Baptism is basically a celebration and remembrance of the day when God saved the person being baptized. Say, yes, he saved me. He delivered me. He set me free. I belong to him. This is who I am. Dead to sin and alive to God. And he's given us this physical. You're remembering, aren't you, Amelia? Yes, she is. It's good. We need to remember our baptism. Because it reminds us in a physical, tangible experience what happened spiritually? Us being given a new nature. Dead to sin. Alive to God. I've been baptized. I remember that day when he saved me. Baptism celebrates a person's day of salvation. Points to it in a visible, tangible, physical way that is memorable. And when we gather together to witness somebody's baptism, we rejoice at the goodness and mercy of God. And we remember our own journey. We remember how great God is that day when He saved me. And He gave me His name. What He's done for us in Christ and who, we're, who we are in Him, it reminds us that we're His. Baptisms are great. 
I love baptisms. But we only get baptized once because we only get saved once. So we look back on that day, we celebrate with other believers who are getting baptized, but we need something regularly because we forget. And so he's given us the Lord's Supper. Gracious. What a gracious gift. This physical, tangible thing to remind us of something that Jesus did on the cross long ago. It's interesting what the kids think. Hey, that's good. We were to raise them in the ways of the Lord. And when we come to the table, we remember his sacrifice on the cross. That awful day. And we remember that through him, as we trust him, he saved us by grace through faith, not by works. And so we come to this table, and our first thought is, we remember Jesus and what he's done. And the second thought is, I don't deserve this. I'm prone to wander. The bread and, and, and the cup, they remind us that we don't deserve to be saved because we're sinners by nature and by practice, we still sin. But we trust Jesus to save us. This is our only hope. And he will. He does. He has. And he will continue to do so. As we take communion and, and we drink that little cup, it's a covenant in his blood. And I don't know all that that means. There's multi levels of meaning there probably, but one of the meanings is he sealed us with his blood. He's put his spirit in us as part of the new covenant. Irreversibly so. We are born again. We are his and we forevermore belong to him. And as we this morning as we hold that little cup of red juice that reminds us of his blood, it's like oh I belong to him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even if I've been bad. Even if I, my appetite is cold towards him, I'm his. Lord, change my heart. It's a great time to have that prayer. As we hold the little cup of juice that reminds us of his gracious, generous love. We might be reminded of our sin. As I praise God, I'm his. He reminded me of my sin. Lord, I turn away from that because I turn to you. Thank you. What a blessing to be reminded of this. Especially during the times when we, when we struggle with sin. This is the time we need to remember who, who, who he is and what he's done. So when, when we struggle with, with sin and we're in the trenches or or when the cloud is on us and we're in when we're in the cloud and and we have to fight for joy to hold that cup and to say I belong to you your life was in me it is good what a blessing to hold the cup and the bread and to be reminded when we're resisting the enemy again and we're standing our ground and we're defending what a blessing it is to come to the table when we despair of ever living in victory it's like oh God this sin has got me it's wrapped around me and I can't get free don't stay away from the table that's when we need the table that's when we've got to come and say, God, I'm yours. You bought me with your blood. Help me to fight this sin with everything I've got. Help me to rip out whatever needs to be ripped out and get rid of this sin because I'm yours. You bought me with your very blood. And we look back to the cross and we look now, and, but, but we look ahead. 
We look ahead. Because we're going to be at a feast one day with, with, with the Lamb. And it's just, it's not going to be, it's not going to be bread and wine. It's going to be a banquet. It's going to be a full 20 course meal. And we'll be able to eat and be satisfied. And the best part about that banquet that's coming is that we're going to be free from the presence of sin. Now we're free from the penalty of sin. There is no condemnation to who believes in Christ. We're free from the penalty of sin. Okay? The devil doesn't have a hold on us. If he's in our life, he's trespassing because we're free from the condemnation. Right? This is probably old news for some of you, but we need to be reminded of the basics of the gospel. We're free from the penalty of sin. We are also free from the power of sin right now. And this is the struggle. But when we sin, as we found out, it's because we want to. Basically, we want something more than God. So he's, he's freed us from the power of sin. We don't have to sin. We do, but we don't have to. But one day, one day we're going to be freed from the very presence of sin. And that is going to be, can't even imagine that. Some of us can't imagine not hurting somewhere. It gets worse as you get grayer, apparently. Some of us can't imagine having a clear mind all of the time. Some of us can't imagine not having to struggle with change. But we're going to be free from the very presence of sin. That's what that reminds us of. Isn't that great? The Lord's Supper is to remind us of Jesus. Jesus said, remember me. In, in, in Luke and, and in 1 Corinthians, he took bread from Luke, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so I looked up that word remembrance. It's different than where it's used in other places, apparently. It's not just remembering, calling to mind something that happened. That's normal remembering. It might be a new concept for some of us <laughs> to remember. It's like to call to mind, oh no, it's gone. But that's not exactly what this remembrance is. It's not just to call to mind what has happened. This remembrance, this remembrance is to call to mind with affection the person of Christ. To call to mind with affection the person of Christ. It's like remembering the one that you love the most. Remembering the one closest to you. Remembering your husband or wife. And it brings joy, it brings delight. Because there's affection. And so we not only remember what he's done in the technical sense, but we call to mind with affection this wonderful Savior that we have. And this is what Jonathan Edwards speaks about when we delight in the diverse excellencies of the character of Christ. He is so good and so perfect. And we can't think of him without having this affection for him. This love for him. This Jesus. There's none like him, is there? Who else would give their life to save the likes of me and you? We were yet enemy. He gave his life so that we could become friends. This is who we remember. And so, as we cultivate a desire for God, and we walk through these 
recognize and repent and request and rejoice and repeat and remember. Around the table this morning, we call to mind with affection the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is excellent. Excellent. He satisfies our every longing. He meets the deepest needs of our soul. And He loves us. His love for us is beyond our understanding. It's so big and so perfect and so pure. What a gracious invitation He gives us at the table. Come, come to the table. You're mine. If you trust me to save you, the table is for you. Come, Remember me with affection. Let me, do, let me do my work in you. Let me remind you of who you are. You're loved and you're mine. And I'm going to change you. What a great invitation. What a great invitation. So in a few minutes, we'll...